Marvellous. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to um, IRMS Scotland and NABCO for giving me the chance to stand up and um, harangue you all about one of my favourite um, aspects of the whole data protection world, which is not what it says, but how to do it. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm Rona Fielding. I'm a major nerd about data protection. I've been working in the voluntary sector for the past six years. I've just joined Protecture, and I'm also the digital officer for NADPO. So I'll, click, I'll start off with um, something you probably might recognize. Being a data protection officer can often feel like this. And for many of us, the advent of GDPR looks very much like this. <laughs> Although actually, it's probably going to end up being quite a bit like this. If you don't recognize the reference, um, that's from 2001 A Space Odyssey, where the monkeys learned weapons technology from the aliens. However, the good news is that GDPR is less likely to lead to war and should definitely curb the potential of scary psycho AIs taking over, which is good news. Glass half full there. So, despite how excited we data protection nerds are getting about GDPR, the attitude to data protection among the general workforce, workforce is generally less enthusiastic. Ever heard your colleagues talking about data protection in these terms? Yeah, me too. Makes me sad. It seems there are some people out there who aren't as enthusiastic about privacy law as we are. And in order to make any meaningful changes to the way our organisations operate so that we can comply with GDPR, a pretty major shift is going to be needed. You've probably heard a lot lately about what organisations need to do to prepare for GDPR. Write policies, review privacy notices, audit suppliers, inventory data assets, that sort of thing. Yes, those are very important steps to take in preparing for GDPR. But here's the thing, successful change requires more than just tools and instructions. Success depends on people and process and tools all meshing together. And to ignore any one of these is to undermine both of the others. If you took one leg away from this marvelously Microsoft paint crafted stool here, the whole thing would tip over. You've probably, um, if you've read the text of GDPR, seen the phrase appropriate technical and organisational measures, pretty much the same as uh, DPA. And the key thing there is both appropriate and organisational measures. In an organisation, if you've got policies that nobody reads, they're not going to be appropriate. If you've got training that people do once a year for half an hour, click, 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 fire and forget, scribble down the answers, pass them to their neighbour, not going to get you very far. If you've got an information asset register but nobody knows where it is or what it says or what it's for, not going to get very far. You've probably heard the joke about how many psychologists it takes to change a light bulb. Only one, but the light bulb has to want to change. <laughs> That's how it is changing things in an organization's culture. And people have to understand the reason for the change and how it's justified by those reasons and what the mechanics of the change will be. So to start changing culture, it's useful to know what culture actually is. Basically, it's what arises from a combination of what people think and believe, what they know, and how they act. When you see culture explained like this, it's easier to get a handle on how it might be changed. So starting with beliefs and attitudes, or motivation. Which of the following statements do you think would carry most weight in your organisation? Show of hands, please. Number one. Not so many. Number two. Okay, everyone's fine with being evil. Number three. <laughs> four. <laughs> Number four. Awesome, pretty much what I expected. Same question. Which of these statements would have the most impact in winning hearts and minds in your organisation, as in really, not just what you put on a glossy brochure to attract your customers. So, number one, is that the most important show of hands? <laughs> okay, that's depressing. Number two, <laughs> show of hands. Okay, number three, show of hands. Mm, okay, interesting. And number four, show of hands. I should imagine if you ask the question, um, do you want to manage information risks in a lot of organisations, people would say, mm, what does that mean? <laughs> so, as was demonstrated there, different organisations have different cultures as a starting point. 
In fact, different departments within the same organisation will probably have different cultures. Um, from my experience, the fundraising department probably has quite different motivations to um, a department in a charity delivering frontline clinical care. So you have to approach them differently. You have to find out what matters to them and then tailor your message around that. So once you've figured out what motivation you're going to appeal to, whether it's competitive advantage or spotless ethics, not too many hands there, or simply staying under the ICO's radar, the next step is to figure out exactly how do you harness that. So we've got a lot of challenges here. Remember the stool? You can't take the legs off the stool one at a time to fix them and expect the stool to stay upright while you do it. Similarly, if you have motivated, informed people who are unable to adopt good practice because the tools they use and the processes they follow don't meet their needs, they're not going to want to change their behaviour. Or if you try and change systems and behaviour and processes without equipping people with the knowledge to understand what it's all for, you're going to be met with resentment and resistance. Anyone who's ever tried to introduce a new IT system can probably vouch for that. So the main problems we have in organisations are lack of knowledge, as in, why should I even care about this because I don't know what it is. Um, systems and process debt, i.e. systems and processes that have grown up organically over time, um, possibly not with privacy at the forefront of people's minds when they were designing them. And behaviours that are just missing or are adverse because that's what people have always done and they don't know why or they don't care why they should do any differently. So when you add all that up, it amounts to essentially quite a big compliance gap. And from what I've seen so far, there's already a compliance gap with the Data Protection Act. When you add on GDPR to that, the gap gets wider. Probably not news to any of you. So it's important to be realistic about what you can achieve straight away in the next year and how long it will take before your organisation has a genuinely robust and sustainable privacy culture. <coughs> so how do you go about making changes? Well, firstly, define what it is you're trying to achieve here. Culture change is not an end in itself. It's a dependency for making something happen. So what is the something that you want to happen? You're probably not going to win any hearts and minds trying to sell GDPR compliance to anyone except auditors and other data protection nerds. However, if you can achieve the objectives that laid out here, people caring about privacy, people recognising good practice and applying good practice, then compliance pretty much becomes a side effect of doing stuff properly rather than just a way to make yourself unpopular. So in this case, you want people to really feel that respecting and protecting privacy rights is important. And so you can't just tell them it's important because they might not take your word for it. You've got to basically grab them by the hearts and minds and make them give a damn. So that comes back to the motivations you were looking at in the first place. You want to get them to change how they do stuff so that what they're doing upholds rather than undermines people's privacy rights. And you've got to get them to understand how and why what they're doing upholds or undermines people's privacy rights. So these are the goals of your culture change activity. You want to make people enthusiastic, you want to educate them, and you want to equip them to do what it is they need to do. Exactly how you go about these will depend on the type of organisations you work for, the resources you have available, and the motivations you're working with. Um, it's quite unlikely that many organisations will have the resources available for there to be a big team of data protection enthusiasts who can go on a roadshow around the entire organisation and get people to commit taking a whole day out of their working lives to come and learn about and get enthusiastic about this stuff. So, probably going to have to meet that halfway. Things that don't work, based on experience. Telling people to read a policy document. How many people in this room have read all of the policy documents their organisation has deployed? <laughs> That's fantastic. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you for being honest. Um, so yeah, telling people to read a document, especially a document that is written in corporate ease 
and maybe 20 to 40 pages long and is a bizarre mishmash of high-level policy statement and low-level instruction, that's not going to win anyone's hearts and minds. So things like just-in-time and nudge learning. So, for example, remember Mr. Clippy? It looks like you're trying to write a letter. Would you like some help with that? <laughs> Obviously not the Mr. Clippy um, itself, but that sort of thing is much more effective at getting people to understand what it is they're doing and why than slapping a huge tome in front of them on their first day and saying, this is what you need to remember for the rest of your career working in this organisation. Another thing that doesn't work is inflexible rules. For example, you must never ever use encrypted US, uh, unencrypted USB sticks, ever. And then you find that you need to take a whole load of information which is completely not personal data, it's not sensitive in any way and it's too big to email, so you use an unencrypted USB stick. And that practice spreads and it becomes normal for people to to ignore the rules because the rules are not tailored with their business needs in mind and there's no exception handling policy. So laying down commandments and expecting absolute enforcement of them is not going to work. Flexibility is what's needed and to be flexible in an appropriate way you need to find out what it is people need to do and how they need to do it so you can help them do it in a way that doesn't get your organisation into trouble with the ICO, get splattered all over the pages of the Daily Mail, get sued by 200 people whose information you've not handled appropriately. Another thing that doesn't work is boring one-off training. With apologies for any, to anyone here who happens to be from the NHS, has anyone ever done the NHS information governance training? Did you find it inspirational and enthusiasm generating? And did you go away feeling motivated and empowered? I know exactly what it is I have to do and I care about doing it right. Hands up if that, that was the case. <laughs> yeah, me neither. Um, E-learning has a place. It definitely has a place. It's great for reaching a lot of people at once. It's great for being e able to evidence that you've delivered training. It is not actually all that good for instilling culture change, getting people to care, and genuinely educating people about how to apply these somewhat abstract rules in real-life day-to-day situations. Unless you put together e-learning modules that are so role-specific and tailored to your organisation that they reach the people you need to reach in the way they need to be reached, that's probably going to cost you more than actually doing the whole roadshow thing in the first place. What e-learning is good for is maintaining retention of information. So, for example, if you were to record um, a, a podcast or a webinar and your podcast and your webinar was um, enthusiastic and made people care and also told them what they need to know. And then you followed it up a month later with some e-learning and then maybe six months later with some different e-learning because otherwise people will pass the answer sheets around. That's going to be much more effective than a half hour fire and forget everybody has to do this once a year. Coming back to GDPR, it's all about appropriate technical and organisational measures. If your learning program does not instill the understanding of why this is important and if not exactly what to do, where to go to find out what to do, then it's not going to have the effect that you need it to have. So what you're looking for is lasting change that has its own momentum. You're looking basically to build a community within your organisation of people who care about this stuff enough to want to get it right. Things that do work. Discussion and interaction. For example, okay, everybody has to read the policy, fair enough. But then following that up with, how does this policy, what does this policy mean for your everyday working? And how would you apply it when carrying out this particular task? Get 10 to 20 people in a room and get them to pick apart the policy. Do they understand it? Do they agree with it? Do they uh, know what it means for their own daily working? That's going to embed the purpose and the content of the policy much better than, here you go, read this. 
the discussion and interaction, really, really useful. Bite-size learning. So, for example, rather than handing people a copy of the GDPR and going, you have to follow this, the just-in-time stuff, the bite-size stuff, repet repetitive messaging, for example, um, as Alison was saying earlier, posters. Posters are really useful. Put a big poster in the ladies saying, did you know that the timeline for responding to subject access requests has been reduced by 10 days? Do you know what this means for you? Go and have a look at our wiki to find out more. That's going to be much, much more effective than emailing copies of the subject access request policy. And saturation coverage as well. You've got so many channels. You've got posters, you've got leaving post-its on people's desk. Email is probably a uh, one that's used quite a lot, but how many people in the room read every single email that lands in their inbox? Yeah, exactly. If you had 300 emails to read, would you read the ones that came from the internal comms department first? Would you read them when you've read all the others, or would you file them under D for delete? Don't worry about answering that. I think I probably know what that's going to be. So email is not necessarily the best way of communicating for all of your messaging. Again, like e-learning, it has its place. It very much has its place. It's good for heads up, there's a thing you need to think about right now. It has its place for welcome to the organization. Here's a list of resources that you can access whenever you've got a question. But to do all of your messaging through email will probably end up training people to ignore emails from you. So posters, if you have uh, social, workplace social media, for example, Yammer on Facebook at work, now called Workplace, or Huddle, or any of those other things, um, find out who is enthusiastic about this stuff and get them to bring in people to a discussion. Um, other things you can do, podcasts, webinars, just mentioning data protection at every possible opportunity that you have, including standing by the coffee machine. All these things help to embed this stuff in people's heads. So keep messages simple, repeat them often, combine FYI background information with just-in-time task-specific learning. Don't be boring. Seriously, I mean, this stuff is not boring. Data protection is fascinating. Why would you want to talk about anything else? A subject has an unfair reputation for being dry and boring. It's really, really not. The more you can bring it to life and make it entertaining, the more engagement you'll see. So humans like stories. Stories have been used to edu educate and entertain for a very long time, longer than we've had written languages or wheels or houses. A story is much more likely to stick in our minds than a user, user manual or a checklist or a policy document. So using anecdotes and analogies is going to be much more effective than listing principles or citing articles. Um, with stories, don't just tell the story, but again, as I said in the earlier slide, solicit engagement, feedback. What would you have done in this situation? Um, what would you have done yesterday with the knowledge you have now? What would you do in the future? Are you likely to encounter this situation? Are you likely to encounter a similar situation? Um, bringing it to life and then making it relevant to the people in front of you, that's really, really valuable. A few words on the subject of emotion. Don't overuse fear. Yes, there is potential for large fines under GDPR. But if you focus on this to justify your GDPR prep, you run the risk eventually of being seen as a chicken little, running around yelling the sky is falling. Especially as based on previous form, most regulators are unlikely to apply the maximum fine, even for the most egregious behaviours. Fear works when you need something to happen or be prevented from happening urgently. For example, we need to hold off on switching over to the new website. There are still security holes that will leak the user's data. We'll be on the front page of the Daily Mail next week. That's a good way to use fear. Specific action, specific time scale, get stuff done now. If you overuse fear for long-term goals or for more abstract stuff, people will start becoming 
inured to the fear. They, it won't have so much of an impact. So goes back to your motivation. If your organisation is motivated by fear, then you probably have more result with that. Um, but if your organisation is motivated by other things, profit, efficiency, good customer service, ethics, then those are just as important or even more important than fear as a communications tool. Fear doesn't work as a motivator for making sustained and systemic changes. It's just too exhausting to maintain. Games are a great way of getting people to do what you want. Look at all the Facebook data harvesting games and the Candy Crush style pay to advance apps. People like games. That doesn't mean that playing Hunt the Recital or just having funky graphics on your multiple choice Q&A is going to instill enthusiasm for the principles of good privacy. The most successful games have elements of storytelling and competition and emotional involvement. So there's, there's possibly a market there, isn't there, for a GDPR version of Candy Crush? <laughs> if your learning material is similar to the iTunes terms and conditions in style, then you're doing it wrong. Much like a privacy notice should not read as though it's a contract, your learning material shouldn't sound like a corporate policy. Don't use three words when one will do. Your vocabulary might be impressive, but using long or unusual words is unlikely to get your message across effectively. It will increase the friction that the individual experiences when they're trying to understand and absorb what you're telling them. It's much more likely to go straight over their heads and not really sink in. Avoid the passive voice, as that sounds weaselly and disengaged. Trick for testing for the passive voice. If you can add by zombies to the end of each sentence and it still makes sense, you're using the passive voice. <laughs> Be interesting. We like interesting. Be the Spanish Inquisition. Be unexpected. Be funny. Be memorable. Effective culture change is incremental. You can't get it done all at once. Look how long it took our society to embed the idea that drink driving was unacceptable or that wearing seatbelts was a requirement. Just having a law does not drive culture change. If it did, there would be no murders. Effective culture change is self-sustaining. You can't build something up and then walk away and have it collapse behind you and call that effective culture change. And effective culture change is necessary and it's valuable and it's worth the effort because without it, all your policies and your audits and your systems and your technologies, um, they won't be effective. So as a data protection or information governance professional, where do you come into this culture change? The most important thing is to make friends and influence people. If all you ever do is say, no, you can't do that, people will stop asking. They'll stop asking and they'll do it anyway, and then you'll have an incident to deal with. If you can offer alternatives, explain risks, demonstrate your understanding of business objectives, even if people don't get the answers they hoped for, they're much more likely to come back and ask again because you've proven that you're not just being a barrier or a hurdle. You've given them options and you've instilled some understanding of why you're giving them these options, which may not match the original proposal. They're also less likely to keep asking the same questions over and over again, because it will sink in. So as a data protection officer, you would not be as much of an enforcer during this transition period or a bouncer or a disciplinarian, you're a translator between law, good practice and business operations. You are a guru, an advisor, occasionally an agony aunt. Own it, enjoy it, work it. That's me. Any questions?